I, I would taught myself electronics, basically from electronic magazines. At a certain point, I was living in London, England. I was going to very early Pink Floyd concerts where there were like 50 people in the room. And I was very impressed with the electronic effects that they had. And I decided I wanted to learn how to do that. So I started buying electronic magazines. And, and I'm being self-taught. I was making a lot of mistakes. I didn't know what a resistor was. I had to figure that out the hard way. I was getting all sorts of smoke and sparks and everything. But I'm a very persistent guy. I started out as a painter. I thought I was going to be a, uh, an artist and so forth. And uh, I love painting and so forth. Uh, but in order to to make a living, I studied biology. And also, I was interested in biology. I loved fishing as a kid. To be out there with fish was, to me, a big deal. So I wanted to uh, learn fisheries biology. So I, I took courses at college in, in this, and I realized after a while I'd be a lousy biologist. I couldn't remember all those Latin names and all that stuff. But I took some art courses on the side, and uh, I really enjoyed that, and that made me switch into art. Although I'm really happy I took biology, because a lot of my inspiration these days comes from those courses in biology. In fact, anybody going into the arts, I strongly recommend that they take biological courses. However, the one thing that bothered me about biology is was that you were constantly cutting things up and killing them in order to understand how they work life. And that always bothered me. It occurred to me at a certain point that when you make robots, you're reversing that process of cutting things up. Instead of analytic cutting things up, you're doing a synthetic thing. And there you're putting stuff together with the attempt of recreating life. Now, nobody has the illusion that anything we make however sophisticated technology will ever get anywhere close to what Mother Nature does. You know, they, they, even something like a single cell animal with its DNA and its uh, RNA and all the complex chemical reactions going in it and its ability to reproduce and repair itself and all that, far beyond anything we can do with our uh, robotic machinery. But, but robotics is a way of paying homage to that to as a way of respecting nature and learning more about it and as we kind of begin to understand a little bit about the way things behave we can then model that with our crude technology in robotics or computer simulations or whatever so th that's really where i came from and it's not so much the way the thing appears. I'm not trying to reproduce the appearance of the of a biological organism so much as replicate its behavior and understand what goes on under the surface. Well, it's it's mind-boggling. I'm still working on a kind of Lego level. <laughs> But I see on the internet what people are doing. Uh, mind you, a lot of it is high budget stuff. What they're doing at MIT, they're getting money from the military. Uh, I guess the most impressive stuff is what's coming out of Japan. And some really fantastic uh, organic kind of robots come in. And they're, they're really into emotional robots as well, like robots with emotion. Start out with Tamagotchis, but it's gone way beyond that. If if I start looking at too much of that, I get really depressed because I know it's way beyond what I can ever achieve. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy still doing it. I'm tinkering in my shop. And, and I guess the thing that I feel that buoys me up is the fact that I'm making it out of junk. I'm taking the stuff that people are throwing out and repurposing it, so it costs me very little money. Whereas most of those organizations like MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and so forth, they're working with brand new expensive material. I, I'm very interested in creating uh, underwater 
uh, robots, autonomous underwater robots. And I've been making them mostly out of junk and they don't work too well. They leak like crazy and so forth. But I realized that a lot of the leakage occurs around the cable connections. So there was, uh, I think, the University of Pennsylvania who was involved in this uh, underwater robot contest, and they published all their parts of their robot, exactly everything that they used in their robot. And so, ah, there's a cable connector there. Mm, yeah. Oh, five hundred dollars for the connector. So, you know, there's huge amounts of money that I can't possibly compete with. At the same time, I. I'm very happy that that there is a pile of free stuff out there, and it makes me feel good to be repurposing, saving it from the dump, and making stuff out of it. the The main hurdle right now is keeping up with the information. Just to give you an example, uh, back in the '80s. Uh, Doug back and I built these arm wrestling machines where you could arm wrestle via telephone. Originally designed to go one in the White House and one in the Kremlin, so uh, Khrushchev and Reagan could arm wrestle whenever they had opposite views. And uh, but anyway, we we did that and with a fair bit of success between Salerno, Italy, and Toronto. Well, recently in last year they wanted to recreate that and so I dug up all the parts and everything and was was very uh, disappointed to find that my modems which were analog modems didn't work with the new digital phone lines at first they were told me they probably would but it turned out they they wouldn't so I suddenly had to learn Ethernet and I had people advising me, people like David Brokeby and Jeff Mann and so forth, uh, but quite often I was getting contradictory information and I was getting more and more confused and they, the final result was the arms didn't work during the... In fact, there was one point which was very comic, comical. I was sitting at uh, Interaxis working on the program and I couldn't figure out whether the arm had suddenly lost all its strength. And then I realized I had left, accidentally erased a line of code, put the line of code back, uploaded that, and suddenly the arm goes boom like that, crashes into the screen of my laptop and totally <laughs> shatters the, the laptop screen. I think I prefer the ones that that are of a broader nature. I'm, to me, a robot that would imitate a crab or an ant or a spider or a frog. Maybe it's my biological uh, bias. You know, those are, to me, really engaging kinds of robots. Now, humans is interesting, too. I don't want to dismiss humans. In fact, the helpless robot, which is one of my pieces, imit imitates the emotions of humans. Even a protozoan. You know, there's a single-celled animal called a euglena that has a little whiplash tail and swims around. It has a little red eye where it can detect when it's getting closer to light. It's a single cell, and it's got a chloroplast where it can generate its own sugar from uh, water and sunlight and carbon dioxide and it uh, it's pretty well self-sufficient given reasonable conditions and there is all this functionality built into a single cell which is totally mind-blowing so to make a robot that just imitate a, a single-celled animal would to me be enough I think the piece that that most engages me is an unfinished work, which is the aquatic uh, submarine, the autonomous aquatic submarine, which I'm still working on. It's gone through five or six different variations and so forth. It's a, 
it's an unfinished project and and in a way I'm most interested in projects that are of their essence unfinishable ones that you keep coming back to that are never you're never going to achieve total imitation of a living creature it's just impossible but you can come back and every every time you show it again maybe it has a tiny bit more of an organic nature and it just you know the helpless robot I showed about seven or eight times I didn't sell it until recently but it got me all these trips to Europe it got me shows um, all over the place and that is almost better than selling it and uh, but I think it's this aquatic robot that really has has my uh, my greatest passion attached to it losing its niche yeah no I think as more and more people see I always believe that what makes a particular um, art form great is the number of people who add their own viewpoints and their own culture and their own uh, way of seeing the world to it. So far it's been largely the domain of engineers and now it's entering the public domain through the maker movement and so forth. And now you're beginning to see it's no longer an engineering project, it's a cultural project that pervades the whole all of society. So the stuff we're going to see, not only in North America, but around the world, in India, in, in China, in uh, Jamaica, in Brazil, we're going to see all these people now being engaged in this kind of thing. The beauty of it is that the information is almost in the air. It used to be that you had to go to university to learn electronics. Now you can pick up a, a Make magazine and teach yourself real popular electronics magazine. The junk is there. It's being thrown out everywhere. The information is there. It's, it's now become an accessible technology. And I, as that enters into all these different cultures, that's really exciting. It's, we've just... If anything, we've just begun robotics.